Well, welcome. This is our penultimate uh, get-together for this series of lectures. So we've been through three aspects of uh, the interchange between neuroscience and architecture. Uh, the experience of architecture, what goes on in the head of a person experiencing a building. Uh, the design of architecture, what goes on in the head of a person designing a building. And in part, that is their imagination of, or simulation some would say, of the experience of people who will be experiencing that final building. And then last time we talked about neuromorphic architecture, this strange idea of giving a brain to a building, an extension of smart architecture with the suggestion it could be informed by thinking about the brains of animals and transferring that to this interaction infrastructure. Now, the last two talks are going to have a somewhat different character. Today I want to uh, report on a discussion uh, about the hand, uh, the hand as seen by a distinguished architect and the hand as seen in my investigations, not only in motor control, but also of the way in which gesture may support uh, language. And then uh, our last meeting, we will follow through on that subject by looking at drawing as another way of architectural expression and how that relates to architectural space. So the way I got into this discussion of the hand as seen by architect and as seen by my research goes back to a meeting at the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in Taliesin West uh, back in um, 2012. Now Frank Lloyd Wright uh, of course, is certainly considered by himself, but by many others as well, to be the greatest American architect of the 20th century. And this is a picture of him visiting uh, the Guggenheim Museum in New York on Fifth Avenue just before its completion. He died, in fact, before it was completed in 1959, and I visited this in 1961, January of 61, uh, on my way to graduate school IT. So, uh, Wright's architecture is in some sense part of the formation of the interest that these lectures express. But in any case, uh, he had, as it were, two uh, campuses. There was Taliesin itself in the Midwest, and then uh, to escape the, the winters, he set up Taliesin West in just outside um, Phoenix, Arizona. And here are a couple of views of the campus that he designed there, which was both his home but also a place in which many students could be engaged in architecture. And so the foundation um, created to maintain uh, this work uh, hosted a meeting on minding design, neuroscience design, education, and the imagination in November of 2012. And the organizer of this was uh, Sarah Robinson, an architect and at, the, at that time chair of the foundation. And she had recently published at that time a book called Nesting, Body, Dwelling, and Mind, in which she had begun to explore some of the ways in which thinking about psychology and phenomenology and to some extent neuroscience could inform architectural thinking. And the foreword was written by Johanni Balasma uh, from uh, Finland. And some years later, they produced this book, Mind and Architecture, Neuroscience, Embodiment, and the Future of Design which includes several of the presentations from the Taliesin and West meeting and also contrast. So this remains one of the, the, the best resources for getting an entree into uh, the discussion of neuroscience and architecture. But the particular stimulus for thinking about how I would work on this was that I had already read and admired this book by Johanni Balasma called The Thinking Hand, Existential and Embodied Wisdom in Architecture. And so this was very much a phenomenological view of uh, the role of the hand, both in terms of bringing in a tactile component to architecture, um, not just a visual component, uh, and the other was taking a somewhat phenomenological or existential view. Now, uh, at that time, I'd just completed and published this book, How the Brain Got Language, The Mirror System Hypothesis, uh, 
which focused on the idea that the path to human language was not through the vocal system, but through manual gesture, which then recruited the vocal system. So that for, for most of us now, speech is the dominant, but by no means the only method. And indeed, as I'm carrying on in this way, uh, we're seeing that even if we use spoken language, the use of gesture of face and hands is, is a crucial part of that. So we really have this, this idea of hands as playing an embodied, uh, diverse role uh, in both architecture and in both thinking about action and language in perspective. So here the emphasis is on the hand, sort of almost imagined as an organ by itself. Um, and so the issue was, what happens when you pay more attention to the linkage of hand and brain, put it in an evolutionary context to bring in symbols, language more generally, and then move it back again. And as I say, uh, today my emphasis will be more on thinking about hand and language. Um, but at the end, I'll look at some drawings where we see, as it were, not pure drawing, but symbolism combined with the drawing in the practice of architecture. And that will set the stage for our final get together um, in which what is going on in the brain as we draw will be the focal issue for our consideration. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is extract with minimal comment some of the statements made by Balasma in his book. Um, and I will try to restrain myself from saying too much about them because then after I've told you more about uh, my brain-oriented approach, some of which you've already seen to the hand, uh, we'll come back and comment in more detail. So let's look at this. The knowledge and skills of traditional societies reside directly in the senses and muscles, in the knowing and intelligent hands, and are directly embedded and encoded in the settings and situations of life. So, obviously, we're going to come back and say, well, maybe the brain plays a role in linking the senses and the muscles. The hand is crucial to the evolution and manifestations of human intelligence. That will basically be a crucial theme of, of my exposition of what was in my book. And then human consciousness is an embodied consciousness. The world is structured around a sensory and corporeal center. Maybe we can agree on, on that. Second, learning a skill is not primarily focused on verbal teaching, but rather the transference of the skill directly from the muscles of the apprentice through the act of sensory perception and bodily mimesis. So how does the brain fit in? Well, he says this capacity of mimetic learning is currently attributed to mirror neurons. And mirror neurons is, uh, are... Uh, components of the brain that we've already discussed, and, and yes, they will play a big role in, in what follows. And then the last uh, couple of quotes, which I, I won't link uh, to again, I think, in this talk today, is architectural ideas arise biologically from unconceptualized and lived existential knowledge rather than from mere analyses and intellect. And I, I'm happy with most of it, um, but if he'd said, r r instead of saying rather than from mere analyses and intellect, um, I would be happy if he said only from analyses and intellect. So that depending on what we're doing, um, our embodied intuitions may be dominant for other things we do. Our uh, formal analysis, our intellectual application are absolutely crucial. So I say, why mere? The issue is not to downgrade the intellect, but rather to see how it integrates embodiment and rationality to do better than might, either might or other. So this is, and I think that's fair enough in the practice of architecture. I think Balasma is railing against a view of architecture that reduces it to a rational process of design and dispenses the way in which imagining how we would be in the building or how others might be in the building, or how we might interact in the building. That is probably what he's concerned about. But I just want to, to say that, in some sense, the slogan for this talk was from, from um, 
hand to symbol and back again the idea that thinking about the embodied use of the hands or our embodied experience more generally can be seen as providing a basis for the development of language where we can practice our rational intellect and then that can come back and inform and refine our embodied experience. The other thing, we, we talked a bit about aesthetics um, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, and here he says, beauty is not a detached aesthetic quality. The experience of beauty arises from grasping the unquestionable causalities and interdependencies of life. And um, firstly, of course, the, the causalities and interdependence of life may indeed be questionable. And the other thing I want to say is that this is indeed strongly uh, culture dependent. But uh, to, to really think through the notions here would require us to go back and expand upon our earlier discussion of the mirror system and aesthetics. Today we're going to be looking at the mirror system to, in terms of its relevance to, to language. So, I first need to introduce a little bit of jargon that I, I found helpful. The idea of the language-ready brain. What do I mean by that? But perhaps if we jump right down here to talk about the idea of the reading-ready brain. We know that all humans, um, unless they have uh, some genuine problems, are able to learn to read. But we also know that reading is only a few thousand years old. It's a cultural innovation. So the brain of earlier humans was ready for reading in the sense that had one magically had time travel available to transport a child from 6,000 years ago to the present time, that child would have no trouble learning to read. But um, the brain was ready for reading, but did not have reading itself. So in the same way, I'm, I'm going to suggest early Homo sapiens had a language-ready brain, but that it took maybe 100, it was 100,000 to 50,000 years ago to go from having a rather basic proto-language system, maybe some words with very little grammar, to a rich and flexible language. So, so that terminology, the language-ready brain, um, informs the discussion by distinguishing the biological evolution that gives a brain that, in the right culture, can do things from a brain that is wired to do those things. So the perspective that I'm, I'm going to be using for, for my discussion today is what we call the Evo-Devo socio-perspective. The Evo-Devo perspective is perhaps better known. This is just saying if we look at the evolution of brain and body, um, what we're often looking at is not we get the evolution of the adult behavior, but rather we get the evolution of a body that can gain the adult behavior. So, for example, our brains are wired up in such a way that at birth we do not have stereo vision, but if we interact normally with the world, um, we get virgin eye movements and we begin to fuse patterns on the two eyes and that alters the, the visual connectivity in the cortex so that we eventually have, um, we have stereo vision. So that, to reiterate, the evo-devo part is we evolve so that in a normal environment our brains will develop to allow us to cope well with that environment. The evo-devo socio is to just bring that cultural evolution to the picture, that biological evolution yielded brains and bodies, that's the evo that could develop, that's the devo in a culture that already had language, in our particular case of language, socio, so that children could master the use of that language with the help of caregivers. So these brains enable humans in interaction to support the emergence of languages, so that's what preceded the, the transition from having a language-ready brain, but no language to having language. This followed in turns by historical language changes. Um, so the same perspective can inform our assessment of any cultural product, such as architecture. So early humans, uh, very simple shelters. Um, so one would say they did know how to shelter from the, from, from the wind and from the rain, but we probably wouldn't want to say they had architecture. 
some people might have a very broad sense of architecture, but in terms of a, a discipline knowledge of how to design a variety of buildings, that's certainly a, a cultural emergent of the last maybe 10,000 years since people started living in cities. Okay. Uh, one other point for, for evolution, not too much relevant to, to thinking about the present day, but uh, Michael Tomasello, who's a big expert on um, comparing the brains of chimps and humans and the behavior of chimps and humans to provide input to discussion of evolution from ape-like distant ancestors to, to modern humans and apes, is that the idea of ratcheting. So if we look at apes, we'll see that apes may have discovered particular types of tool use, for example, how to get to strip a stick and stick it into a termite mound, pull it out with some termites on it, and then enjoy eating the product. And different groups of chimpanzees around Africa seem to have quite a few of these so-called cultural variants. But the idea is they're sort of one at a time um, and nothing accumulates. So this is what uh, Tomasello calls ratcheting. And we are now able to consciously reflect upon innovations, whether to adopt them, discard them, refine them, or build upon them. So we go from cultural evolution maybe coming up with one or two innovations to cultural evolution going cumulative. And we might say that we have cultural evolution on hypersteroids at the moment in, in our current society, perhaps too fast for us to truly assimilate, but that's a, that's a different issue. So let, let me just offer within this framework of cultural evolution a link back to architecture to take this book from quite a few years ago now by Harry Francis Mulgrave, who before that was best known as a historian of architecture. But in this uh, book, he combined his interest in the architecture of history, in the history of architecture, with um, some forays into neuroscience. And so, what he did in the book had two parts. The first part basically went through some of the great architects of history over the last two thousand years, and didn't really so much talk about the brains of the architect, but at least talked about the mental styles, the cognitive styles of the architect, with some suggestion about what was going on. So the cognitive style of each architect in a historical review, what can one infer about their brains? Um, and the point is that we have different cultural milieus and environments changing the brains of architects. So milieu and individual develop thanks to neuroplasticity. So that just to close out this general background, but having linked it here to the notion that architecture varies from culture to culture as well as from architect to architect, is the idea of niche construction. Um, within evolutionary theory, the idea of a, a adapting to a niche. So one animal might adapt to living on land, another adapt to living in the sea. One might adapt to a, a hunting of other creatures, carnivorous diet, another might adapt to a herbivorous diet. But the crucial point is that animals not only exploit the existing niche, they may change it. So that beavers, for example, famously construct dams, and the environment changes once there is a dam on a river rather than a free-flowing river. And then not only can the beavers uh, descend to, to altered beavers over time, but other creatures can adapt to exploit that, that new version of a river environment. And with humans, uh, we have obviously changed our, our physical world uh, completely as we go from uh, hunting and foraging in um, open savannah to, to living in cities, for example. But the point is that at each stage, then, we are changing the niche, um, both culturally and physically, and that we have evolved in that context. And so in particular then, going back to the idea of the language ready or the architecture ready brain, we might say in the last 200,000 years, yes, some biological evolution has continued, but cultural evolution has come to dominate the dramatic change of the environment, both mental and, and physical, to which each of us adapts as we grow to become adults. So just a, a little schematic uh, 
the body reflects culture, culture reflects body. We have brain and body here. We have a cognitive or social niche here. And our concern, although I'm going to be focusing on language for the moment, our concern with architecture is what is a social product that in some sense interfaces between these. How will the brain and body experience the, the in this case, uh, constructed niche? And how will that niche change brain and body? And uh, of course, the big concern of many architects engaged in discussion of this neuroscience architecture uh, discussion is how can that be beneficial? How can one build an environment in which people thrive rather than uh, sort of warehousing workers, as might have been the case in early 19th century England. Uh, so let, let's just go back to some slides we remember to get started. Um, we emphasize the idea of the hand uh, grasping things. But here we're getting the, the, the first point that is crucial to our discussion of the idea that the hand um, is an instrument for interacting with the world. So the hand shape is affected by the world. The ability of the hand to shape and manipulate changes the world. So that's the, that's the grounding for what comes next. And I want to just use this diagram, which was a little implicit in what I said before, but let's make it fully explicit now. The idea that the brain uh, can send its visual input through many, many pathways, but in particular we discriminate what comes up here, parietal cortex leading on to the motor cortex and with the mirror neurons, and then this other path which goes through the temporal lobe and then into frontal cortex and then can influence decision making. And a, a classic study, um, or two classic studies, distinguish the case of someone who had a lesion in the parietal cortex and could, for example, tell you how big something was or how oriented it was, but could not, but could not use that information to direct a hand movement. So they would reach towards a goal with sort of a, an open hand shape, and it's only when they hit the object that they would conform, relying on tactile rather than visual input. And somebody with a lesion here could still pre-shape appropriately to grasp objects, but could not describe the shape or the size of the object. So the, 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 the message here is what may seem like a seamless unity to our introspection may in fact involve different processes in the brain being coordinated in, and orchestrated. And the reason I say this is because uh, Balasma, like many other people, uh, employing the language of phenomenology, emphasize our experience where our experience is that of quotes a typical person in our typical culture. And what this shows is that, in fact, there are many different facets of the brain that must work together to yield that behavior that we, strangely, in some sense, our consciousness is within us. But in a way, it's also looking at ourselves from the outside and that we're only seeing the unity rather than the, the separate pieces. And so I think it's a really interesting question for future work at the interface of architecture and neuroscience is to say, if we understand that there are different processes not accessible to our consciousness, but they work together to create our conscious impression, then maybe we can learn how to design buildings that can separately tweak those subsystems to yield perhaps um, innovations that would not otherwise be uh, possible because we're only thinking about consciousness as a seamless whole. So this is what I mean by dissecting phenomenology, that the phenomena that we see by seeing how people behave and describe their experience is not the full story. Neuroscience can add to that story. Um, so let me, um, just while talking about this dissection of phenomenology, uh, remind you of the notion of the body schema that we talked about in week one. Um, Head and Holmes uh, define the body schema as anything which participates in the conscious movement of our bodies is added to the model of ourselves and becomes part of those schemata. A woman's power of localization may extend to the feather of her hat. This is a sort of Edwardian English gentlewoman with a big hat with a, a feather hanging out the front. But, but as I think I remarked in week one, uh, a, a typical 
experience for us is if we are just wearing a hat and we come to a low doorway, we may uh, duck the head to get through, whereas if we know we're not wearing the hat, uh, we don't duck our head. Or backing a car, we extend our body schema so we really, uh, if the car is familiar to us, we can navigate in very narrow spaces without fear of collision. So that idea of the body schema um, as, as extending ourselves seems to me, um, uh, and perhaps I'll make this point again uh, more explicitly, is that in some sense then we can go out from the body but in from the environment. So in that ducking the head example or parking the car in a narrow space example, it's the way in which we find a complementary relationship between our body, possibly extended, and, and our environment that together create our, our embodied experience of that environment. And so understanding that better may be very important to our, our future work. But the other thing I want to mention is, is heavy neglect. Um, so, so let me just use a, a, a slide again from week one just to remind you of that effect which is quite amazing. This is a, a study of Bisiak and Luzzati in Milano, um, now already 40 years ago, but um, they had people who had uh, damage in roughly this area of the brain, uh, of a vascular stroke to the right parietal cortex here at the, uh, not quite in the, the occipital cortex where the visual cortex is, but just up and above it. Sort of that area that we talked about earlier involved in the um, the dorsal pathways. But anyway, a person having this one-sided lesion will lose the other half of their body. Um, I mean, depending on the, the extent of the lesion, there'll be different effects. But so such a person may, um, when putting a shirt on, just put it on the right side of the body and not put it on the left side of the body. And if the, the nurse or clinician says, well, what about this arm? He says, that's not mine. Well, it is an arm. What's it doing there? Well, I suppose the surgeon put it there as a practical joke. I mean, really bizarre rationalization of this uh, neglect. But what Bisiak and Lazzari found was even more amazing, where people were asked to imagine that you're standing in the, in the, in the uh, plaza in front of the Duomo, the cathedral, and tell us what you can recall. And they would just recall what was in their right hemifield. And then... Um, now this is the amazing part. Now say, now imagine that you've turned round and the Duomo is behind you. Now tell me what you can recall. And they would recall again <laughs> the other side of the plaza, which was in the right hemisphere. So the structure, the memories were all there, but their, um, their ability to recall those memories was dissected by this brain damage in a very counterfactual way. So the only point I'm making here is not to get us into a discussion of is hemi neglect relevant to architecture, but rather to suggest that as we get the lessons that Balasmar and many others have got from phenomenology, uh, the invitation is to make a second pass to say, well, what is it about the brain that supports that phenomenology? And then as we understand how different parts of the brain differentially contribute to that, we may be able to enrich our thoughts about the meaning of that phenomenon, phenomenology, a sort of neurophenomenology that lets us perhaps design for processes that are below the level of unaided phenomenology. Okay, so now we're, we're ready to get technical and remind ourselves of a few more things before we get into the the, the sketch of this evolutionary story. So uh, the, the notion is that here's a monkey brain. Uh, Hideo Sakata and his colleagues in Tokyo were monitoring a place in the parietal cortex where they found that cells were coding for not what an object looked like, but how to grasp the object. A small sphere, a small cube, you're going to still use a precision pinch. So this part of the brain would not register the difference. This part of the brain, the, the, the ventral what pathway, would register the difference. But then this information could be passed to the motor schemas in an area called F5 and frontal cortex. So that's the basic geography 
we're going to be uh, starting from. And then, of course, as we've seen in week four, we actually talked a bit about it last week, uh, we have this discovery of mirror neurons, the idea that if we record in F5, the group in uh, Parma found that there are some neurons that are not only part of the activity when the monkey itself does, in this case, a precision pinch. These are the individual recordings. Here's the histogram that shows this is a cell that's really active in this case. But also, when the monkey observes someone else doing a similar grasp, we got perhaps not as active, but still considerable active. So the, the terminology that emerged from this was a mirror neuron is active for execution of a limited set of actions and observation of a strictly or broadly congruent set of actions. Whereas the canonical neurons are those that had to do more of the heavy lifting, as it were, when it was a self-action, but were not engaged for an, another action. I mean, this makes sense. If you're looking at somebody and you're seeing what they're doing, you don't have to worry about what are the exact disposition of the fingers, what's the exact tension of the muscles that made that possible, so that the, the premotor cortex and in instructing the motor cortex has to engage more neurons than are required for, for the general characterization of the action that suffices for either seeing the action as successful when you complete it yourself, or for uh, monitoring the action of other people. Now, the, um, the breakthrough came by, by looking at Broca's area in the, in the front of the human brain and finding that part of it corresponds to F5 in the monkey brain and that when you image this uh, area, it behaves like, a, a, like what you would expect an area rich in mirror neurons for grasping would do. In other words, it would be active both when somebody grasped an object or when somebody saw somebody else grasp the object with the baseline, what's the activity for just looking at the object? And so this was really puzzling, perhaps. Why would there be a mirror system for grasping in Broca's area? Because traditionally, Broca's area is thought of as a speech production area. And the missing link for me was provided by Ursula Belugi, just across the road from UCSD at the Salk Institute. She and her husband, Ed Klima, had been studying the sign language of the deaf. And in their earlier work, they looked at showing that you could, that this really was a full language, you could give a grammatical description, a linguist description. But then in later work with Howard Poisner, they discovered that there were some people who used, were deaf, used sign language, but had brain lesions involving Broca's area. And then they found there was aphasia of um, sign language similar to a phasure of spoken language. And so this led to the crucial statement that allowed us to interpret these results, which was, no, Broca's area is not a speech production area, it's a language production area. And so its computations in terms of generating or comprehending language are sort of in the middle. And then whether that's challenged, channeled to hand control or voice control, whether it's activated by visual input or auditory input, that's not the point. There is a system. Now, of course, given our earlier discussion of language ready, that doesn't mean it's a system with built-in skill for grammar, but it's a system that when a child is raised, whether as a deaf child or a hearing child, can come up with the combination of vocabulary and grammar and so on, that will bridge between um, comprehension and production. So that's the, this was the, 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 the stage that was set by these observations in the monkey, the, the parallel with the, with the human. And it's perhaps worth noting, as I put at the top, that this came first, saying, oh, uh, there are these properties of the mirror neurons. That then inspired brain imaging to say, well, is there an area we can't see the individual neurons, but at least we can see the overall activity. Is there an area that corresponds? So yes, so the, the hands are relevant to language, um, is, is, the, is the inference here. And so um, Giacomo Rizzolati and I published a paper with the preliminary ideas in place 
back in 1998, which we call Language Within Our Grasp. Here, 14 years later, is the book How the Brain Got Language. And what I want to do in the next few slides is just give you a sense of the overall argument here and invite you to, to look at the book to see much more detail. But let's introduce this idea of language parity. One might think that this would be a theory about linking the parrot to, to language, but it's not. It's the idea that language works because you can have conversations. I mean, that's the crucial point, that I can say something, there's a reasonable chance you'll understand most of what I'm trying to say. Uh, you say something, there's a reasonable chance I will understand. There's no claim that it's perfect, but there is a claim that uh, language allows us to... to um, to exchange meaning back and forth. So the suggestion was that, um, okay, we've got the mirror neurons allow us to, I do an action, you recognize the action. Um, so in some sense, it's parity at the level of manual control. Maybe this could be the basis for parity in language. I'm going to go into that in a moment, but I, I have to put in a clarification um, to avoid a confusion. When we say, I recognize this as maybe a precision pinch, um, whether I'm doing it myself or you're doing it, um, that doesn't exhaust what the brain has to do, right? We, we, if I'm going to pick up a peanut or pick up a, a piece of uh, lint, um, this will be part of an extended set of actions. Um, so the actual seeing what muscle control the hand has had to exhibit to achieve a piece of the behavior is not the same as having an understanding of the brain mechanisms that control the behavior. So that the distinction between sort of the fine grain control of the behavior and the overall planning of the behavior, which then requires fine grain details for the execution of each piece, that's an important dichotomy. And so, um, when I talk about language parity, I am not, 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 as some people think, saying the mirror neurons do language. What I'm going to say is that there are really two parts of language parity. One is that if I pronounce a word, even if you have a different accent from mine, um, for language to work, you've got to know what the word is, word, is. But then there's the complementary thing, is that you've got to know something about what the words mean, and you've got to know something about the grammar of the English, or, or the French, or whatever. So if you, even if you are perfectly good at recognizing the sounds of English, if you don't want to know what words mean in English, or you don't know how words are put together by English grammar, you're not going to understand what I say. So the, the claim is that the, the mirror neurons for action are going to evolve via mirror neurons for gesture to mirror neurons for the articulation of speech. But it's only because they're embedded in a larger system, over here the planning of a sequence of actions appropriate to a situation, over here the planning of the overall meaning of a sentence that puts the word together or pulls the words apart to comprehend. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so the mirror system hypothesis holds that language is built on imitation and skill transfer. So in other words, the child has to be able to acquire the sounds of language, the way to put those words together, and then language can take us from uh, manual imitation to, to a whole symbolic structure based on it. So I'm going to come back into next week and bring drawing into the picture, so to speak. Um, and, and say that both support the complexity of human culture, and in some sense, for many an architect, drawing is a symbolic process closer to their architectural intuitions than the use of languages. But we'll offer a sort of bridge uh, between the two at the end of this lecture, and then come back to drawing as a brain process next week. So.
here's the story. We, we start with the fact that monkeys, and this, this jargon, L-C-A-M, uh, is for the, what's the last common ancestor? So it's not that monkeys evolved into apes, apes evolved into humans, it's that we have a, 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 an evolutionary tree, if you like. 25 million years ago, we have our last common ancestor with the monkeys. Five to seven million years ago, our last common ancestor with chimpanzees, who are our most closely related apes, and then up here ourselves. <coughs> so, what we see is that monkeys can't do very much in the way of imitation. Apes can imitate fairly well if it's just a matter of, um, I know how to do this, I know how to do this, I know how to do that. Oh, you did that, you did that, you did that. But if, in fact, you have to do uh, thoughtful variations on what's going on, then um, the, the, the imitation fails. It takes a lot of trial and error. In some sense, we might phrase it by saying that the ape recognizes a few sub-goals and then either can deploy a known behavior to achieve each sub-goal in turn, but, but cannot see what are the details of the motion of all. My favorite example from my colleague Masako Miowa in Kyoto is where uh, the, the human demonstrates the following. There's a ball sitting on the table. Uh, the demonstrator picks up a ball and places it under, over the, the, the ball ball over ball. The ape cannot get that. It cannot say, look, the crucial thing is the ball doesn't move and the ball moves. The, the ape just says, oh, you want the, the result is to have the ball in the bowl. So he'll pick up both and moving them both will place the, the, the ball in the bowl. So this idea of what I call simple imitation, it's not that simple, of course, in the brain, but it's more on attention to sub-goals than to how movements are shaped to achieve them. And what we have is a complex imitation system. It doesn't mean that we can imitate everything first go. But we can, firstly, look at how another person is behaving and, and break it down into pieces. But we also um, can use this recognition to, to put it together. And more generally, we, we can see some of the details of the motion so that we can uh, better and better approximate the performance by saying, well, oh, you seem to do that. Okay, let me try to do that. Um, I refer to the distinction between this and this by what I call the IKEA effect. So this is you buy a furniture kit from IKEA and you, you see a picture of what comes next and you don't bother to look at the instructions you say, oh, I know how to do that. You grab a piece, you jam it in, you grab another piece, you jam it in. And finally, you see it's a total mess. And then you have to disassemble it and then start over again, paying attention to what the constituent movements are, not just what the, the sub-goals are. So that's the sort of idea. So um, imitation for me is the key. Uh, and, and let's just fast forward. I'm, I'm talking here at a stage of evolution long before we have a language-ready brain. But clearly, the ability to um, recognize what another is saying um, and imitate it is crucial to the child's building up um, a vocabulary. But then, what comes next is that the ability to understand what another person is saying is more this complex action recognition, that each word, if you will, is a familiar action. And so you can grab the sentence by recognizing what the pieces are. So at this stage, you no longer perhaps need the imitation. You've already acquired the vocabulary. You're just using the complex action recognition. But you needed that imitative ability in the first place to be able to get to the way you yourself could deploy um, the proper pronunciation of the words of your language in your community. Okay, so here's the sort of story. Uh, part one is getting to proto-language. So what's the idea here? Um, the, the, the hypothesis is that 200,000 years ago, maybe, um, humans did not have language in the sense of a rich vocabulary, a rich grammar, past tense, conditional, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they, they had a moderate vocabulary, but 
very little grammar with which to, to put words together to convey subtle new meanings. So um, I'm going to get you to the language-ready brain, where I suggest that the language-ready brain meant that you had proto-language, but you didn't yet have grammar. So we have grasping, a mirror system for grasping by our common ancestor with the monkey. Um, we get up to a simple imitation system with our last ancestor with the, the chimpanzee. We get then, in hominin evolution, in other words, in the last five million years, uh, complex action recognition and imitation comes. And then the suggestion is that the pathway to communication is that this complex imitation, or perhaps more precisely, just the complex action recognition, provides the basis for pantomime. So if, if I do this action, then you might infer from that that I'm holding a cup and lifting it to my lips. And then, depending on the context, you might see that as an invitation for you to drink or a request for you to give me a cup of coffee or what have you. So the mixture of context and, and pantomime convey me. And the suggestion is that it's because you have learnt to recognize that this is the sort of hand position approximately for holding the handle of a cup. And with this, you recognize the familiar movement of people bringing the cup to the lip, that even though there's no cup, you're able to get the, I, the analysis of the behavior to say, what is that behavior, even though I can't see the objects involved, and then use context to infer that that's a communicative message. So what's interesting here is this is building on complex action recognition to create a new ability of pantomime, but it's also a cultural development, a cultural evolution, because um, if I just did this um, in, in a society that had never used pantomime, it would be a meaningless gesture. But if you can have a culture that has learned that people can create normal pantomime and use it to communicate, then you have the beginning. Now, the problem with pantomime is that it is very, in, in two ways. One is it, it's costly. It takes a long time to carry. And secondly, it's highly ambiguous. So uh, the suggestion is that the next step was that within a community, and this is a, a totally general uh, possibility for any culture that has the idea of pantomime, people can pantomime to each other. But protosign says we're going to start conventionalizing these to both make them less costly to perform and also to make them um, less ambiguous. And these become, um, as I say, more community or tribe specific than pantomime. So here's, here's an example of a, of a, 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 a this sort of thing from American Sign Language. So this is not saying this is what happened. It's an ahistorical example, but it gives some sense of a process. So uh, maybe I'll make a hand shape like this, which is meant to indicate the fuselage of a plane with its wings extended. And if I do this, and we don't know anything about American Sign Language, we might think, OK, you're pantomiming a flying plane. But in fact, um, what American Sign Language has done is use this basic pantomime, as it were, as the historical precedent for two distinct signs. So if you do just this, it's the sign for flying, whether it's a plane flying or not. And if you wiggle this in place, then that's the sign for plane. So this is the idea of the transition from what might be a pantomime people would get if I do this as my pantomime, that's perhaps even more vividly going to give you a sense of a plane to this very economical um, proto, well, in this case, the sign of a language. So the idea is, though, before we got to signs of a language with a grammar, we had proto signs where conventionalizations allowed us to communicate things relatively economically using the hands. Um, and then the other datum we need, if uh, you'll forgive that architectural term. The other datum we need is that other apes and other monkeys don't have uh, much in the way of vocal control. So that it required an evolutionary breakthrough to have the voice 
as a medium for communication of novel words or proto-words. So the suggestion is that once the idea of putting apparently arbitrary gestures that had emerged from conventionalization of hand movements and pantomime together, then the possibility uh, that provided an adaptive advantage to extend that to, to, to make vocal gestures as well to, to pull into the performance. So this is the sort of biological story, but emphasizing that various cultural things had to happen along the way to get us to this stage. And then the full story, which is way beyond what we can uh, get into today and don't need to get into today, is that once early Homo sapiens emerges, they have proto-language, cultural evolution then dominates, um, and the ability to break a, pan a pantomime into pieces allows the emergence of um, both fractionation into candidates for now words, as well as the emergence of ways of putting those words together. So, for example, if I do a pantomime like this, um, you might recognize that, okay, I'm pantomiming um, closing a door. If I do it this way, then you might get that as pantomiming opening a door. The only thing common to them is this movement, but then you might fractionate this into distinguishing this as a separate uh, protosign from this. And now you've done you now have a protosign for, strangely, door, which actually has nothing to do with door. It's the fact that you've got a door handle. And then this complementarily becomes the sign for open, and this becomes the sign for close. And now you have, now you've got um, a separate sign for door and for open, and now that invites you to change the slot. So um, I, I could have a sign for mouth, and place that here for mouth open, and here's close, I could place it here. So we begin to build constructions. These are ways of putting words together, as well as building more and more words. So that's, that's the basic idea. Phonology, lexicon, constructions all co-evolve, and as we learn ways of putting words together, we begin to put words together in ways they haven't been put together before, and this may be irrelevant wordplay, or it may allow us to define new concepts. And so again, we have a spiral of, we build new concepts of the world, we build new ways of expressing those concepts, and each one feeds into the other. So now we, we've got from hand to symbol. Um, and not just from hand to symbol, from hand to language. The idea that um, by seeing the richness of our bodily interaction with the world, especially that involving our hands, We've seen how that refines itself through stages of social interaction, the transfer of skills through imitation, and then the abstraction from the working in the immediately with objects to being able to work in the absence of objects to get a message across and building from there to language. Okay. So with all this, I now want to go back to two of our slides of uh, comments made by Balasma and see whether our excursion into neuroscience in general and into the particularities of one theory of, of how language emerged can allow us to both agree with a lot of what he says but perhaps go a bit further. So. The hand is crucial to the evolution and manifestation of human intelligence. Well, that's certainly where we agree, and the mirror system hypothesis is one version of trying to work out the details of how, in fact, the hand plays a key role in charting the evolution of human intelligence by extending that to show how language, which is in many ways uh, a primary but not the only tool of intelligence, can fit in. Okay. The human consciousness as an embodied consciousness, the world is structured around a sensory and corporeal center. So, what I say here is we must distinguish the external world from our own construction thereof. It's the latter which is structured around but not restricted to a sensory and corporeal center. So, maybe you could say, okay, it's still a sensory and corporeal center. Our experience as bodies moving through our environment interacting with other people, experiencing culture. Yes, that's all got a center, but um, if we read a book of history or a book of mathematics, or even think um, 
through all the details of constructing a large and complex building, then we've moved beyond referring everything to our immediate sensory and corporeal center can handle it as that larger mental world that has grown out of our experience within a rich cultural milieu that makes it possible. So, so that's the extension I want to offer there. The knowledge and skills of traditional societies reside directly in the senses and muscles, in the knowing and intelligent hands, and are directly embedded and encoded in the settings and situations of life. Well, uh, what can I say? It takes a brain uh, to, to build a village. No, it takes a brain to link the senses and hands to support that intelligence. It requires the brain's plasticity to acquire the social schemas of a particular society. In fact, you may remember last week when I went into some discussion about the uh, relation of the hand with its uh, local sensing apparatus and local control of degrees of freedom to see it in some sense as a, a separate little creature, but it only made sense because it was connected via the body to the brain, which could provide new sensory information. So it's that linkage which we actually illustrated in the design of the self-cleaning room last time that, that relates perhaps to what we're talking about here. And then the other point, of course, is that, as we keep seeing, we are, cult we are creatures, no matter how much our innate endowment of emotion and, and uh, hand control and vision, no matter how much that is in place, um, the social schemas of our society uh, are very much part of our view of the world. And that rests again on the brain's plasticity, which is shaping both our physical and cultural experience. Okay. The, the other um, learning set of, of, of ideas in response to Ballas Bar, he says, learning a skill is not primarily focused on verbal teaching, but rather the transference of the skill directly from the muscles of the apprentice through the act of sensory perception and bodily mimesis. Now, uh, certainly this, once we bring the brain into play, is, is the idea of complex imitation I discussed. Though this is a lot more than the muscles that requires the ability to, to break things into pieces to see how to concentrate on that and then how to put them back together again and automatize the relation between different parts of a behavior. So, um, and often verbal instruction provides a shortcut. So, um, even if before you get to verbal instruction, um, the, the way a child learns at a very young age is by not simply just observing what the other, what the caregiver is doing, but the caregiver will direct the child's hand, will direct the child's attention, and so this sort of directed imitation um, is, is involved. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Pat zukov goldring studied um, this directed imitation in young children in Los Angeles, both English-speaking um, children and um, Spanish-speaking children. And what she observed uh, was that where the English-speaking mother would keep saying, look, look, to try to direct the child's attention, the Spanish-speaking mother would um, say, mira, mira. So we decided this was evidence for mira, neurons. Okay, the last one is the capacity of mimetic learning is currently attributed to mirror neurons. So this was where I went into a little excursion where I looked at the difference between mirror neurons recognizing this specific action rather than recognizing the pattern of behavior or mirror neurons recognizing the articulation of a single word as distinct from understanding how the words are put together and linked to meaning. So um, basically, it takes more than mirror neurons. Monkeys and apes do not have complex imitation. They certainly do not have language. So um, I'm not going to develop this, but in terms of my own professional work on, as a computational neuroscientist and as uh, somebody thinking about the neurobiology of language, this idea of thinking about how multiple systems beyond the mirror interact with mirror systems is a crucial component of understanding what humans are. And my hope is that as our conversation with architecture continues, 
we'll see how some of those insights about the multiplicity of brain systems fits in together. But that multiplicity of brain systems again brings us back to that earlier point about dissecting phenomenology. Um, just to, to remind ourselves of the, um, the body schema and the idea that uh, we talked about the, the feather on the lady's hat. Similarly, when we use a, a screwdriver, our body ends at the tip of the, the screwdriver or perhaps even at the tip of the screw. Um, so this idea of extending the body in this way but the other point is that a carpenter doesn't use a single tool, so we, we have this flexibility to extend our body in many ways. Now, I, I talked before briefly, and this is just to reinforce that point about we can sort of extend the body schema out from the body as we add tools or a car or, or clothing, but we can extend in um, from the, the building. Um, when we introduced Gibson's affordances, we talked about the environment provides affordances and the body provides effectivities. And the point is that we have to match um, what we can do with what the environment affords for us to be able to do. So I think we can sort of revisit themes right from the beginning of our discussions by, by thinking about this idea of building out the set of effectivities and building in the set of affordances. So in some sense, a building is a set of tools for living or a set of affordances for living. And, and of course, it gets subtle when we uh, bring in our, our discussion of atmosphere. So the affordances are not only for the, the physical interaction, but also for the aesthetic appreciation. So we talked about neuromorphic architecture last time, where we might think of the building as an inside out robot. This is going a little further, right? Because now it's saying, um, once we give the body its own brain, interaction infrastructure, and its own dynamics, um, then it too has effectivities, and it too is looking for affordances. So what's the body schema of the building? How does the building change our body schema? Uh, and this gets back to the social cognitive neuroscience that for us to, to effectively integrate with others, then we are not only coming up with our own actions, but we are modeling, recognizing the actions of others, trying to represent what their mental state, what their plan is, what their, their in intentions are, so that we can change our activity in turn. So you can see a, a basis for conversation, if you will, in what is called theory of mind. So one of the questions that last week's discussion poses to us how can we learn more about modeling the brain of others by thinking about the interaction between humans and smart architecture? How can the interaction between humans and smart architecture be informed by developments in social cognitive neuroscience as we interact, as people interact with an increasingly smart environment? OK, just a little detour, and then I'm going to rush through some pictures to prepare us for, for next week's discussion. In the, in the slide I, a couple back, I talked about the use of tools in terms of expanding our, um, our range of effectivities for interacting with the environment. And a lot of the um, archaeological work that informs our thinking about how humans have evolved in the last culturally evolved in the last 200,000 years and biologically evolved in the million or two before that uh, is the, the remains of stone tools. So the craft of, stone, of tool making has often been seen as uh, both important for our archaeological studies of human background and also crucial for um, the uh, evolutionary record. And so, for example, we have been very excited by the discovery that uh, New Caledonian crows um, could not only use tools, they can use uh, leaves, they can then serrate them a bit, and then use them to dig out insects, but apparently can do other amazing things. So here's Betty the crow in Oxford, who um, learned that there was food in a bucket inside a glass tube uh, had access to a wire and then bent the wire and used it to remove this. 
very impressive. Um, but it is an adaptation of an innate ability. We, we have no reason to doubt this is pre-wired. And I just want to look at another um, innate ability, which is the ability to construct nests, the ability of this African mast weaver to construct this immensely um, sophisticated nest. So I think that in terms of this affordance effectivity story and so on, um, I would like to see in future much more analysis of these innate capabilities to complement the, the study of, of tool making. And I think this may give us some real insight. Um, interestingly, Sarah Robinson's book was called Nesting. Um, but it wasn't pursuing what we can learn from construction techniques for nests, but rather in terms of um, the, the notion of the, the, the child caring in the nest uh, as a model, perhaps, for the uh, feeling of home. But this is just a, a sketch for today of a, what I hope will be a, a future and lengthy conversation. So just to summarize then, um, in the next couple of slides, language is handy from symbol to hand. We, we found we can, for example, enrich instruction. Um, we start with imitation skill transfer, perhaps as a pre-stage. Uh, pre um, uh, of uh, ha manual skill. The mirror system hypothesis suggests how language might have built on that as a foundation. But we've also said that language and pictures can enrich um, the, the uh, transfer of skill, the exploration of the world. And language can take us beyond mere embodiment and can set our imagination free to envision new re realities for better, great architecture and worse, hateful ideologies. Anyway, these are two senses of language as handy, that language evolved from the hand, and that language itself provides an immense range of tools to extend human capability. So, in the last part of the talk, I just want to, to look at the, the back again of the title, that, uh, and then next week, the, in our final meeting, drawing language in the representation of architectural space. So let's look at the mix of spatial awareness and explicit use of symbols that goes into well-developed and architectural drawings, designing the experience of the building, designing the construction of the building. So we could ask, how do plans and drawings relate to the lived experience within and around the final building? How do they relate to the process of design and construction? We're back, as we have been now for quite a part of the discussion, to affordances, effectivities, and the body schema but also um, the issue of how do we map the world. So here's some slides from Duncan at um, the New School of Architecture and Design, just, just to look at some of the ways in which we can see um, not just our embodied experience, but a whole range of symbolic experiences which challenge us. So uh, here we have a site map. Uh, we're going to put a building down, a new, uh, we're building a sports park structure. We're gonna put various fields and arenas in that area. Um, this extends not, this extends perhaps our capability to imagine our path from one place to another, but this requires a level of symbolism. Um, both there may be symbols written on here where we have words to tell us uh, what the different uses are and characterize them, but, but also the whole idea of the the Cartesian map or the Euclidean space and the layout of that kind. So there's another form of symbolism that's being engaged. Um, it's interesting, this is what's called an allocentric map. Um, before the age of aeroplanes, and except for views from a bell tower or, or a high mountain from time to time, our experience of is from a ground level view as we move in and between buildings. Uh, so this is already a highly symbolic form, although one for which the sort of language structures putting words together is, is not the point. But instead of a grammatical relationship between words that allow the way we put the words together to give them me new meaning, here we are seeing how various graphical symbols can be put together where it's their spatial layout that conveys a meaning that we can relate to our embodied experience of moving around a particular site. Here's sort of a classic um, pictorial view just to give a sense of uh, 
what the final result will look like. So this is uh, probably rendered on a computer, but, but nonetheless uh, photorealistic uh, to impress the, the customer, I guess, the client, uh, to give them a sense of what's going on. Whereas the, the next view, an internal view, um, sorry, it's not there, so we'll come back to it perhaps. So here we're getting into a, a, a whole system representation where again the use of language, uh, the use of spatial layout um, is combined to uh, give a, a sketch view which is now taking into account the effects of wind, the effects of sunlight and so on, as well as the relationship to, to a system of transport. So again, we're seeing not just in this case, again, we're moving away from our embodied experience of the place to a higher level of abstract thinking about what does weather do and how do we provide various means to, to accommodate it. Um, similarly here in terms of a, a, a much more formal representation of a, of a, a cross-section of the building but augmented with this um, a pictorial representation of sunlight, a pictorial representation of the movement of air to, to allow an assessment of whether one in fact is covering the, the thermal challenges of, of sunshine and wind. Um, here is a, a sort of hybrid uh, of a, a slightly cutaway view tending to give you some sort of sense of the affordances and effectivities of the building. Um, but not exactly what you would see yourself. Um, here a pure cross-section, very formal. Um, the average person might not be able to get all that much out of it, um, but it could allow, whereas an architect can see this and, and get only through this strong development of the linkage between symbolism and, and meaning, uh, could be able to in some sense see the three dimensions uh, and feel the movement through it in a way that most clients would not be able to, although this could be a handy mediation document to be augmented by language by pointing here and maybe then tracing a path that represents uh, movement in the building to, to describe what different things are happening in different places. And, and here finally uh, is a, a very intricate diagram for construction purposes rather than this is, if you will, long beyond the beyond the, the conceptual task of the architect, um, but crucial to making sure the building will be constructed accurately. So um, to conclude then, we could ask, is the language ready brain also an architecture ready brain? Uh, perhaps more so. Um, I've already suggested that maybe thinking about those bird nests could get us link, uh, thinking about how the brain has many capabilities of assembling objects to get more functional objects. So maybe there's something there in addition to the story I've been talking about with manual skills. But the language ready brain is culture ready in many ways. Language gives us shortcuts to sketch a skill. If we go back to our second week together, our discussion of Zumter and Utzen stressed the long process of enculturation that the architect must go through to have a brain that is capable of designing uh, buildings, and we've talked about neuroplasticity. So that's it for today, and as I say, we'll wrap up next week by uh, building on some of the intuitions of the last few minutes of today's discussion to think about how drawing uh, relates to the brain, and maybe, maybe there'll be some implications for our discussion of the linkage between architecture and neuroscience, by emphasizing the sort of uh, capabilities of the hand to sketch the world that come closer, I think, to Balasmar's intuition of the role of the hand in the practice of the architect, um, complementing the role of the hand in experiencing the tactile realm of the finished building. Thank you.